My name is Kostin Tukulescu, CEO and founder of AnyMeeting.com, and you are watching Eye on Business. Hello everybody, this is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report on Eye on Business. Each time we talk, we speak of insights, things for angel investors, venture capitalists, but more importantly for entrepreneurs and chief executive officers or CXOs of any kind of business. And today I have a subject that I think will resonate with all of you who have raised money in the early stage. And we'll call this one, if you can't think of anything else, the best advice that startups will never follow. So here are three things, actually six things that we're going to talk about that I think are really important. Number one, never take money from relatives. Do not take money from relatives unless they're willing to lose it. Because most relatives, and I'm afraid to say this is a truism, expect that it is a bond between you, the money, and them. And even though the business could fail, and I have to tell you that more than half of those businesses that are financed this way fail within the first five years or less, relatives often expect their money back. And so be very careful with that one, that maybe three times. Maybe you ask them first if they're willing to lose the money. The second time, wait a while and ask them again. And then finally ask them a third time. And if they say yes three times, you probably are sure that they understand the risk that they're taking in doing that. Never take money from relatives unless they understand the risk. Number two, never take unsophisticated investors' money. Let me tell you a story. I was a co-founder of a very small company in the Southern California area, and there were only two investors, me, in the form of a loan, and the cousin of the entrepreneur. And when the business failed, the cousin of the entrepreneur sued. And he sued the entrepreneur for really no reason at all other than the fact that the business failed. And he sued me and my wife and my family trust. Well. Quite a bit of money later, and I can't reveal the exact amount because we finally settled just to get out of this thing. We ended up paying that entrepreneur's cousin because he didn't understand the risk of having loaned money to his own cousin for a startup. So number two, do not take money from unsophisticated investors. Now those are two good don'ts. Let's talk about a couple of good do's. So here's a good one that I think is important. If you can, make those investments equity, not loans. Why? because then they participate in the gains with you at the same time, and they don't come ahead of you. They and you are both equal, or at least semi-equal, as it comes to the amount of money being put into the business. Do take equity and not loans. If you have to take loans, make it sure that they understand that you may have to extend the payment terms from what the loan document states. And if they understand this, because small businesses often cannot repay those loans, it's important for them to understand that their loan is really a form of equity. Number four, make sure that you don't, even if your hair is on fire, value your company so high that the excitement of the day makes the company overvalued. This is the biggest problem entrepreneurs face because many times in the enthusiasm of the day, the entrepreneur will form a business, say the business is worth $10 million, get money from relatives and unsophisticated investors, and then when the next round is finally raised by those sophisticated investors who know better, it becomes what we call a down round, which means the company is valued at a lower rate. It angers everybody. It doesn't even make the new investors happy because they know that they're making an investment contrary to the way the most people who invested before want to hear. So never overvalue your company. You're much better leaving money on the table and finding the next round is not a down round, but rather an up round. That's probably the most important of all of these six. Number five, take smart money if you can, not just money from other people. I know this is one that's easy to say. Smart money comes from sophisticated investors who understand, first of all, that they may be giving you more than money. In fact, I wrote a book that uh, in 1993 entitled Better Than Money. I rewrote it in, 19, in 2006 and called it Extending the Runway. Its thesis is one we all have to hear. Good money, smart money, brings you five things, not just the money itself. 
It teaches you, first of all, how to use the time of the corporation, the critical time, to make things faster and do things better, which uses less of that money, doesn't it? It allows those investors to share with you their experiences in the context of the way in which the business operates. In other words, those investors often have seen five, six, ten other business plans that are like yours and have a feeling for where yours fits. Is it way too early for the marketplace? Is it so late that there are other businesses that they have seen in the form of other business plans? Context. Then there is relationships. These people have a golden Rolodex, using an old term, or a golden PST file, if you want to call it that, that they can put you in touch with people who are important, who can make things happen for you faster, easier, and better. Whether it is supply or distribution, it happens that way. And then finally, and kind of importantly, we have talked about time, money, relationship, context. The final one is process. Is there some way that these people can give you a process instruction that will help you to get from here to there faster? In other words, can you get the product out the door faster? Can you do something faster using less money than you would have done before? All of those things are related, aren't they? That taking smart money is worth more than the money itself. And then there is the final one. We look at the possibility of what happens if they don't get it? What happens if you think that because somebody turned down your investment, your, your claim that they don't get it is a very common claim that we hear from entrepreneurs. And the fact is, when they turn down the investment and tell you that they aren't going to make the investment, and this will happen often for all those that you actually get, you should be able to learn something from that. So my advice is, ask why, and then ask why again. And ask, what could I do differently? Not necessarily, will you look at me again, but what could I do differently? What made your decision a no? You'll learn so much from that that you'll find that getting a no turns out to be an educational, uh, excuse me, an educational opportunity. So those are the six things that many, many entrepreneurs fail to heed. And yet, we just talked about all three of them, and uh, all six of them. And if you do follow these six things, you will be, I hope, a smart entrepreneur taking money at the right time from the right people for the right reasons. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Ion Business. Welcome, everybody. My name is Andrew Bermudez. I'm a new team member here at Ion Business. I'm also an entrepreneur. I have a startup called Digzy in the commercial real estate tech world. We are lucky enough to have one of my really good friends and mentors, actually, Kostin Tugulescu, here to join us to talk about getting funded and the different avenues and the pros and cons of doing that. So that being said, Kostin, thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. This is super exciting. Uh, we're it's on, on huh? We're on TV. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> From behind a desk and a computer to in front of a camera. This is cool. And you thank, changed thank your shirt before you got here. You know, <laughs> just uh, cleaned it up a little bit. You look great, man. I'm so proud of you. Son. Right back at you, buddy. Hey, so let's talk about um, a little bit. So you have a startup. Tell us a little bit about what you do and what your company does and sure. just a little bit of that background. Sure. So I am the CEO and founder of uh, AnyMeeting.com. We are a online meeting and webinar platform that provides everything from phone conferencing to web conferencing to uh, webinar services. Uh, we initially started off as a full freemium offering and have since grown into full pro suite of tools, everything uh, from holding sales meetings, uh, recording them, presentations, all the way to thousand person webinars. So uh, are you allowed to say, so you've raised funding and you were one of the guys that taught me how to raise funding when I went out to do that. Are you allowed to say the amount of money that you have raised in aggregate? Um, yeah, I don't know why not. You know, okay, we, yeah. we, we've raised uh, almost $3 million from cool. angel groups. Uh, we've had a lot of support from the angel community and been able to uh, get support from Tech Coast Angels, Pasadena Angels, Sand Hill Angels in the Bay Area, and the Koretsu Forum, which I think we'll, we'll be talking about that whole process. Perfect. Um, and then, so, so you started uh, web conferencing. What made you want to be an entrepreneur in that space? Well, so uh, I started off as a coder. <laughs> and, um, you know, didn't really know a whole lot about gr starting companies or growing businesses. I just had this product. I eventually um, coded up a, a product where you could do presentations online and uh, put up a website for it. And we started getting signups. Uh, we started getting uh, white label resellers. So they started uh, taking us, taking our product to their customers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was early days for me. That was a company I started called Instant Presenter. 
Uh, I tried to raise money for that company and failed miserably, <laughs> uh, even though it was doing uh, pretty good revenues, but investors felt it wasn't fundable, and that was like a really important lesson I learned, what was a fundable business and what wasn't. Um, and then created a different model around it. A, the freemium model really gave us massive growth, uh, basically 10 times the monthly growth of Instant Presenter. Uh, started talking to the angels, and they saw that growth. They liked it. They felt we were disruptive in the industry. And um, that's, that's you know, when we raised our first uh, round back in 2011. Yeah, making the shift from being a coder and behind the computer to having to be outward facing and meeting people and pitching, that's a whole different world. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sure, you know, we've talked about this offline before, and I'm sure we can uh, piggyback on that uh, for a different segment. But so you guys are in revenue today. Yep, absolutely. And you guys have been growing. Uh, you, have, you guys have put uh, a very impressive team. You've had people from, you know, uh, large competitors uh, who've joined your team which is fantastic, uh, former serial entrepreneurs. Now, you um, have actually raised money uh, not only from the traditional angel route, um, but you've also um, gone into some of these other angel-type funds, which some people uh, find controversial, uh, yeah. where you have to pay sure. thousands of dollars to pitch. So can you share a little bit about your experiences? Because you've raised from both. Yeah. Let's talk about not paying, and then let's talk about paying and what the pros and cons are and what your advice for entrepreneurs would be. Sure. That's like seven questions put together. Yeah, let's see how, I'll how, keep you how track. to frame that <laughs> positively, right? Yeah. So, so I, I do think there's a stigma around, hey, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm trying to build something, uh, yet you want me to pay you such that you can, your group can help me. It's kind of Because you usually don't weird. have money when you're, when you're an entrepreneur. That's right. You're starting out, um, you know, if it's a, a seed round, that's absolutely, you know, you're, you're eating ramen all day, uh, and these groups charge three to $5,000. So, um, so, so that's when you really need to evaluate um, what that expense means to you. So what will it take to get ROI on that expense, right? Well, normally in, a, in, in an angel investment, if you get one angel investor to write you a $10,000 check, that covers it, mm -hmm. right? And it's, if you think about it, if you were to pony up $5,000 to present to a large group of people, and you're not able to get one person to invest in your company, you've got some real work to do. Mm -hmm. Because uh, my experience with Koretsu Forum, for example, which is a group that charges, you know, around there, three to five grand, right? Uh, and at, at first I was nervous about it, but what they, the product they give you is they put you in front of easily 120 angels. And so for me, it was like a road show. Um, especially the, 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 the Bay Area chapter. And you were actually flying all over the place, not yeah, only San Francisco yeah. to do this. I did, I did the Bay Area chapter, which is, you know, uh, four different uh, mm -hmm. groups. So you're there for four days. I also did uh, the, the Pacific Northwest, where I went from Toronto to Seattle to Portland. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I guess my point is you're really uh, putting it on the line, you know, and... Um, you should be able to get ROI for your money. But you were able to get funding, so it did pay off for you. That's right. Uh, Even one investor will pay off for that. For, for, for that so if you, uh, if you go pitch and you don't get, your, you don't get any investors, you're aft. <laughs> I, well, I think that's even a bigger signal. Yeah. Right? Because you're, you're going in front of 120 angels, mm -hmm. right? And your message doesn't resonate with a single one. That's almost such strong validation. Yeah for, hey, you know, something's really wrong here with your pitch, mm -hmm. maybe with your product or your company, yeah. right? So um, it's one of those things where if you believe in yourself and you've got a good message and, and, and um, uh, you're a strong presenter, it's it, no-brainer ROI. So mm -hmm. a quick question on that. So you have, uh, uh, you know, well-known angels like Jason Calacanis, who when he found out that Kairetsu was doing this, he just went, like, through the roof right. and even started his own open angel forum to, like, rally against why are you charging an entrepreneur who eats ramen all day to go pitch? Yeah. Um, now, it, taking that in, in mind, now you've gone the traditional route, like you've been funded by Tech Coast Angels, Pasadena Angels. What was your experience and the difference between paying and not paying f to be able to pitch and get funded? Was there anything that was like, hey, this is something insightful that I found out from the two different groups? Well, so there's a lot more coaching and mentoring and a longer... Uh, cycle with the non-paying groups. So it took me about, you know, a year of pitching this new freemium product and showing them the metrics and they're like, okay, come back next month and come by, you know, a lot, lot of back and forth for me to finally close financing uh, from those groups. Um, with Coretzu, it was a lot more transactional. Mm. You know, you really, you're all in, 
you're really focused for four days. Um, they work with you ahead of time to make sure your pitch is good. And mm -hmm. if you're too early, they will actually not even accept you. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's somewhat respectable. They won't just take anyone's money. Yeah. Um, and, and I think if you look at it as a product, it's a certain product that the result is an audience. They give you an audience for your message uh, of, of a angels that are known to invest. Yeah. So, you know, I've raised hundreds of thousands of dollars through Koretsu. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was a really valuable experience. It, it basically opened up the channel for me. Yeah. Um, so what I would recommend to entrepreneurs is hone your game in, you know, raise the, the first seed and, and really get the traction. Get to the point where $5,000 um, won't kill the business. Yeah. And make sure that your pitch is strong mm -hmm. and that you have good traction. And you're getting 100, 100 to uh, 120 people in a room. Is there any way around that? Like, can you offer them to wash the dishes afterwards and they won't charge you the five grand? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure there is. They're, they're, they're business people. Yeah. Maybe if you do their website or. Yeah. Uh, I'm Hispanic. I used to work at a kitchen, so. <laughs> I'm Romanian. I, let's see, what can I do? Maybe uh, I'll do some gymnastics or something for them. So what advice would you have? For, I mean, we got a, just about a minute left, but yeah. um, what advice would you have for an entrepreneur uh, facing? Granted, they do have five grand to invest in something yeah. like that. Yeah, think about it as, as another channel to get exposure mm -hmm. for your company and for your pitch. Perfect. Um, you're, you're getting, they definitely deliver a product of putting you in front of people who write checks. So if, if you're on that fundraising track, yep. I'd say you've got nothing to lose. Awesome, man. Well, hey, thank you for coming. Really Thanks appreciate it. Thanks for having it. me. Yeah, appreciate it's it. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Dr. Henry T. Nicholas III, and you're watching Facets Television. Hi, I'm Sandra Hutchins. I'm the Sheriff Coroner of Orange County, and you're watching Facets Television. Hello, my name is Judge Jim Gray. I'm retired from the Orange County Superior Court, and you are watching Facets Television. Hello, you're back with me, Judge Jim Gray in the Judges Chambers. In this segment, I'd like to talk to you about terrorism, liberty, the contradictions, and what is really happening, at least from my standpoint. And I certainly don't have all the answers, but it's clear that the terrorists want us to live in fear. And actually, the more you look at government, the more the government wants us to live in fear as well. It prospers if we are terrified. And by the way, there really is a saying in government, you don't have to do anything in government, you just have to look like you are. And so the thing that they do to look like they are making progress is to take away our liberties. There's always a reason to take away our liberties. There's always an expedient why we have to give up some of our liberties to have more security. You'll remember that quote from Ben Franklin saying that any society that would give up some of its liberty for a little more security deserves neither. 
And so when we're looking at what is happening, they're trying to go into our cell phones. They're trying to go into our email accounts and our bank records and the rest. Uh, now they're trying to have drones flying overhead to monitor us. Uh, it simply isn't the right thing to do. Why? Think of it this way. People all around the world still love America and they love Americans. Why? Because they would give anything to be able to come and live in our country. And what is it that makes us special? It's our liberties, it's our freedoms. They are our soul. So let us not give up our soul because if we do, the bad guys win. And in a lot of ways, that's what's happening today. We are living in fear. We're living in fear of the Muslim community, thinking that there is a, there's a, a terrorist behind every bush. Nonsense. That's not reality. If you're going to be involved with Islamophobia, you're simply going in the wrong direction. That is not what we stand for. Shariaphobia? Yeah, that's where I am. Every Muslim I know doesn't want to have Sharia law in our country any more than we do. So let's focus on really what is happening. It's not our liberties that are at fault. It's their liberties that makes us special. It's what the terrorists really are going for. Let's not let terrorism win. Let's not let fear win. Let's let America win and support our liberties. That's what I think from the judges' chambers, and I certainly hope that you will agree with that. Hello, my name is Judge Jim Gray, and you are here again with me in the Judges' Chambers. For all of these segments in the Judges' Chambers, it's important for you to understand that I'm a retired judge, particularly in this segment, because it's unethical for a judge to talk about issues that might come before him or her. And one of the, what we're going to talk about now could very well, but a retired judge does not have that restriction. So I'm going to talk about liberty and the California drought. I live here in the state of California and it's abundantly clear that we are in a drought situation and we have been for numbers of years and it could very well continue. And so, of course, what happens? Well, we all need to conserve. And by the way, I really feel that I'm one of the good guys, that I turned off our sprinklers a long time ago. I hand water less than once a week and try to be really careful uh, with the use of water all the way around. And I hope that all of us do. However, it is simply no authority for the city councils, the city governments, the water districts, in effect to tell us when we can water our grass. Or you can take a shower but not a bath. Or, you know, you can use your water for your roses but not your gardenias. It has none of their business. It's a matter of liberty. The water districts are in business and they have a monopoly to sell us water to furnish us water. And that's fine. And if we're using more water than should be, they have every right to have it on a sliding scale and to increase the cost. And that's absolutely the right thing to do. However, they do not have the right to tell us, once they've sold us that water, how we can use it. That's a matter of liberty and that is something that should be resisted. Many of us remember, or at least have read about, during the Second World War when the government had a rationing on such products as gasoline or butter. And that, of course, was for a legitimate reason. But once you used your allotment, once you purchased your gasoline, purchased your butter, the government didn't even go through the pretext of saying that they could control when you would drive your car with the gasoline, where you would drive, whether you'd use your butter for uh, hot cereal, yes, but for toast, no. That's none of their business. It's a matter of liberty. So resist any attempts by the government to yet again encroach into our lives and control how we use these various products. They have a right to charge for them. They even have a right to ration them if it comes to that. But once we get this, it's a matter of liberty. It's so easy to give up our liberties to the government, so hard to get them back. Help me in this effort. It's American way. Our soul is at stake. Our liberties are at stake. Let's stand up and enforce them. That's what I think from the judges' chambers as a retired judge, and I hope upon reflection you agree. Hello, this is Judge Jim Gray, and you are here again with me in the judges' chambers. You know, I was in the Peace Corps, and it was quite a learning experience. I think that the people in Palmar Norte, Costa Rica, learned more from me than I learned from them. 
Three important lessons that I learned were, one, you cannot involve yourself in putting in a project unless the people there feel a felt need, as we called it. Because if they don't see a need for it, you can put in all these wonderful programs and have them be efficient and everything else. It won't work unless they feel that this is necessary. By the way, we were going down there in community development. And here I was, just graduated from college, didn't really have much skills. Am I going to develop your community? I don't even speak your language etc. So it was a bit arrogant, but you have to put your feelers out, talk to people, and figure out what they believe the needs are in their community. And only then will you get community support. The second thing is, if you're going to put in a program of any kind, it will not be successful unless it will continue on well without you. So try it as soon as you can, even though you have this great program that's up and running and functioning well, try to start grooming a successor and even put in a board of directors or other group that will help groom further successes thereafter so that you can be on the sidelines and watch your baby humming along. Otherwise, it'll be real successful until you leave and then it will collapse. If you want a short-term fix, that's fine, but if you want something that will go in perpetuity, set up that progression and then step back. The third thing I learned was the only thing better than an orange was a peeled orange, but that's a different question. That's what I think from a judge's chambers. It's had a lot of fun with you, and we'll do it again next time.